the nutrients found predominantly in bioavailable forms and animal foods help with hair regrowth, hair maintenance, hair health, and you don't get that on a vegan diet. On this week's podcast, I am talking about hair loss. And specifically, I wanted to talk about different types of hair loss and compelling evidence that nutrient deficiencies are more often than not connected here. When I go online and I search hair loss with Penn or Mayo or Harvard or any illustrious medical university institution, I never see any of them telling people that nutrient deficiencies could be connected here. So I wanted to get this information out there. So there are many nutrient deficiencies that are reproducibly consistently seen in people with male pattern hair loss, female pattern hair loss, alopecia areata, and telogen effluvium. I talk about all those different types of hair loss in this podcast. And I talk about my concerns with mainstream hair loss therapies, specifically things like finasteride, also known as Propecia, a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor with some pretty scary potential side effects for humans. So enjoy this podcast on hair loss and maybe you'll have some new types of shampoo at the end of it. You'll learn about that in this podcast as well. So enjoy this one, guys. Hope it's helpful for all of you. I recently posted a thread on Twitter about hair loss and connections with nutrient deficiencies. And so the responses were really interesting. There were a lot of people chiming in on the Twitter thread saying that they had improved their hair loss of various types, both men and women, with changes to their diet, specifically including more animal foods in their diet. And so I wanted to show at the beginning of this podcast some of those responses and then get into why I think this is happening on this podcast about essentially nutrient deficiencies and hair loss. So I will look at some research in this podcast linking nutrient deficiencies of many nutrients, many minerals and vitamins with hair loss of different types, both androgenic or androgenetic. It has two names, alopecia, which is male pattern baldness, and things like alopecia areata, which is usually a localized loss of hair for an autoimmune condition, or telogen effluvium, which is something that happens at the end of the hair cycle related to stress, post-pregnancy, postpartum, things like this. So in all of those conditions, there are links to nutrient deficiencies. And yes, I'm saying that for androgenic alopecia, male pattern baldness, which most hospital systems, most ivory towers of medicine will say this is related to, quote, toxic male hormones or too much DHT, which I'll get into in this podcast, and your genetics, I've never seen at Harvard, at Penn, at Mayo, at any of these medical institutions talking about male pattern baldness, this could be related to nutrient deficiencies, and there's a good amount of evidence to suggest that it is. So let's begin with some of these anecdotes people shared on Twitter. So the first one is from a woman. For those who are watching on YouTube, you'll be able to see these. Uh, her, her handle is actually Recovering Vegan. She says, my hair was balding, thin, and brittle as a vegan. I am shocked by the growth on eight months of a full carnivore diet. She's age 61, and she has a photo there, which looks amazing. Um, another gentleman says, after trying 100s of different types of supplements and shampoos, the only thing that works for me is lamb's heart and liver supplements. Shout out to Heart and Soil Supplements. Fine hairs are growing on my scalp where there was no hair at all. I suppose that means nutrients are getting to the roots. Um, another person on Twitter whose handle is hilariously, I smell cow farts, says, since moving to carnivore, my hair recession has slowed and even possibly reversed with the fingers crossed emoji. Um, but wait, there's more. Another person on Twitter says, what if I told you after two years of carnivore, my hair has started growing back? I would say, yeah, I've heard that a lot of times. And there's a very well-known anecdote that's been posted on Reddit of someone significantly regrowing his hair on a carnivore diet. Skytrader002 says, beef and eggs grew my hair back, got thicker and less gray. Another woman, Sherry, says, when I was eating whole foods plant-based, I was losing so much hair, it was everywhere in the house. Switched to ketovore, which is essentially zero carb carnivore. My hair loss is way down, even my husband noticed it. So these anecdotes go on and on and on. And I just thought it would be an interesting way to start the podcast with those and then get into some of the science behind why this is happening. And then at the end of the podcast, I will go into compounds in some plant foods that could potentially worsen hair loss or worsen androgens like DHT. My hair is growing like crazy. Check out this review on hair, skin, and nails 
from Heart and Soil Supplements. If you're listening to this podcast, you're probably interested in hair growth, and this is a supplement I would recommend you try first. This person says, after extreme hair loss from a vegan diet, I switched to animal base. It's taken three months now of taking hair, skin, and nails, but my hair has finally stopped falling out and has grown back in completely. It's a miracle. I was patient and stuck with it. I used to lose gobs of hair in the shower. It was coming out in huge chunks. I could barely keep a hair clip to hold my hair up because it was so thin, it would just slide out. It was getting scary for me since I've always had thick, beautiful hair. Well, now those same hair clips are staying put. And when I shower, I'm noticing a very normal amount of shedding like five or 10 strands. My skin is much plumper too. And my face no longer looks haggard from three years of veganism. At 39, I feel I'm looking better than ever and I'm not getting wrinkles. My scare is glowing. Thank God for Dr. Paul. And oh, I had bad SIBO. That's gone too. I take hair, skin, and nails and beef organs daily along with raw milk, eggs, a pound or more of meat and fruit, honey, and a little kefir. God bless you all. So that's cool. I mean, we get so many reviews at Heart and Soil Supplements about this supplement, specifically hair, skin, and nails, which contains liver, trachea, and scapula cartilage, and bone marrow in it. So check out hair, skin, and nails and all of our supplements at heartandsoil.co. That's .co. They're all packaged in glass because plastic is bullshit. And who needs more microplastics in your environment or in your life? All of our supplements are grass-fed, grass-finished, or generally raised, heartandsoil.co. Our mission is to help you reclaim your birthright to radical health, my friends. So let's just start the podcast by talking about the basic types of hair loss. I mentioned this briefly, but I'll just recap it in a little more detail. There is androgenic or androgenetic, it goes by both names, alopecia, which is male pattern hair loss. Females can get a type of male, quote unquote, patterned hair loss or a female pattern hair loss. There's good evidence that I'll show in this podcast. This is mostly related to nutrient deficiencies, specifically things like iron, possibly lysine, but females do tend to develop iron deficiency more commonly because they menstruate and lose blood every month throughout their whole reproductive years, starting at the age of 12, 13, and going until mid forties. And many women I think are also easily, what word do I use here? Seduced <laughs> by a plant-based narrative. I haven't quite figured out why. And so women are eating less red meat. They're eating more foods with phytic acid, which prevents the absorption of iron, especially the iron we know in plant-based foods is less bioavailable than animal-based iron. This is heme iron versus non-heme iron. I've talked about this many times in the past. So like so many nutrients in animal foods, plant foods don't stack up and they contain versions of these minerals that I'll talk about in this podcast that are less bioavailable. So women who have patterned hair loss, usually that's an iron deficiency and correctable oftentimes by eating meat. There is also alopecia areata, which is a localized hair loss, usually in a circle. This is an autoimmune condition and I think should be treated as such. I have repeatedly seen so many people improve autoimmune conditions with getting a lot of vegetables out of their diet once they've gotten processed foods and seed oils out, of course, that being the first step. But sometimes people react to vegetables with an autoimmune reaction. That was That's my story. For me, it was things like probably kale, lettuce, and mushroom extracts were triggering my eczema and potentially worsening other autoimmune conditions for me and potentially also pasteurized milk. Many of you know that I drink mostly raw milk now, or exclusively raw milk, I should say. So I think that some people with autoimmune conditions get a lot better when they cut out these vegetable-based plant foods. That's a very interesting aspect of a animal-based diet or a carnivore diet. If you're new to these terms, a carnivore diet is something I think of that is just meat and organs and animal fat and salt. People also call this ketovore. And an animal-based diet is a term that I've sort of used to describe a diet that I think is more inclusive and has more variety with organs and meat, but also fruit, honey, and raw dairy. I think of these as probably the foods that our ancestors ate most commonly in their hunter-gatherer days, potentially a good starting point for people, less restrictive than a carnivore diet, but I think also um, very nutrient-rich and very low in the plant toxins that are common in vegetables, vegetables being things like leaves, stems, roots, and seeds of plants. So those are those terms used in this podcast, and people use mostly the word carnivore in the, the Twitter thread that I was showing. Uh, if you're interested in an animal-based diet, Heart and Soil Supplements is doing an animal-based 30, which is a free challenge. It's happening the month of August. Even though this podcast is coming out late in August, it's not too late to join. It's free, animalbased30.com. There's resources, discounts on the supplements, and there is all sorts of guides and recipes and stuff. So go to animalbased30.com, animalbased30.com. Sign up, it's not too late. Uh, there are, I think there's over 25,000 people joining us this month for this animal-based challenge, but who knows? Maybe you'll get some hair growth coming back. So 
that is alopecia areata. Telogen effluvium is the loss of hairs in the telogen cycle of hair growth. So uh, pause there and I will show on YouTube or video platforms a picture of the hair growth cycle, which may explain these terms that you'll see in some of this research more clearly. So if you're watching on a video platform, you'll see that the beginning of hair growth is a phase called anagen. We will see that word in some of these articles that I'll show. There's a hair shaft, there's a dermal papilla, which connects to the hair shaft. When the dermal papilla is separated from the hair shaft, you enter a phase called catagen, which is short-lived. And then telogen, when the dermal papilla is separated from the hair shaft by the epithelial column. And then early antigen as the hair is shed and a new hair is growing in the hair follicle. Now, 90% of our hair is in the antigen phase and it can last for years. This is hair growth. Only 2% is in this catagen phase, maybe 10%, give or take, is in the telogen phase. And again, antigen lasts for years. Telogen can last for weeks to months and the catagen phase is very short-lived. So when I say telogen effluvium, it is the early loss of hairs in this telogen or telogen phase that I'm talking about. So hopefully that helps. So those are the three types of hair loss that will be addressed in these articles that I'll show. Again, most of what people are thinking about when they think of hair loss is male pattern baldness, which is the androgenic alopecia. And it is striking to me that there's a good amount of research showing deficiencies of nutrients that can improve this or help with other treatments in tandem. So what nutrients am I talking about? Well, there are good studies suggesting that many minerals, zinc, copper, magnesium, and selenium, and vitamins B12, E, D, and folate have been shown to be deficient in people with androgenic alopecia. And I'll show an article detailing that in a moment. There's also research looking at things like L-carnitine supplementation, improving hair regrowth. And where do you find L-carnitine? Maybe I'll keep you in suspense for a moment and then tell you that it's meat. There's the carn, the C-A-R-N Latin is in there. It's carnal, kind of like carnosine. Something I spoke about a few podcasts ago when I was talking about longevity and nutrients that are connected with longevity, and many of those nutrients are found exclusively in meat. In fact, all of the nutrients I was talking about in that podcast were found exclusively in meat. So you can go back to podcasts if you wanna hear my arguments for um, unique nutrients found in meat that have solid evidence for improvements in longevity. I would say looking to invalidate or at least challenge strongly the hypothesis that meat is in any way bad for longevity. And I've done that on multiple podcasts at this point. Along the same vein, there's evidence that taurine a nutrient that I've been enamored with recently, which has been studied across multiple species and improves longevity in worm models, in mice, and in primates, and still probably needs to be studied in humans, but how do you study longevity in humans? That's pretty difficult, basically impossible, unless you're doing a case control or a prospective study. Perhaps you can't actually do an interventional study looking at longevity in humans, so you get why that hasn't been done, but in primate models, taurine supplementation improves longevity. Well, taurine supplementation, or deficiencies in taurine are linked with hair loss. I mentioned iron deficiency with women specifically and female pattern hair loss, and also deficiencies of the amino acid L-lysine have been linked with hair loss. So what we find is this pattern of nutrient deficiencies. And then I look at that and I think, where do humans get these nutrients? Where are the most bioavailable forms of these nutrients? Well. As I've spoken about in the past with regard to things like zinc, for instance, which has been studied in great detail and found to be very helpful in preventing or perhaps um, even reversing hair loss in some cases, especially the androgenic alopecia, what is the best source of zinc that we know of in humans? Well, it's oysters and red meat and animal foods. And so I found it quite ironic that if you look at zinc, and I'll show evidence in a moment corroborating the claims that zinc is super important for hair loss prevention or improvement of hair loss, and so we can go to the ivory tower of all ivory towers and look at Harvard. And I'm showing a video uh, for the people that are watching, people that are just listening. You can go to the video if you wanna see this. Here's a Harvard article about zinc, zinc's a trace mineral, et cetera, et cetera. Where do you find zinc? Well, meats, poultry, and seafood are rich in zinc. And I find it incredible and a little bit ironic that Harvard admits this clearly, something I've been saying for a while. Some plant foods like legumes, which is beans and whole grains, are also good sources of zinc, but, and this is a big but, they also contain phytates that can bind to the mineral, lowering its absorption. So 
when I talk about phytates, which is essentially phytic acid and things like oats, people always criticize me and say this isn't a big deal, but they do and they have been shown repeatedly to prevent the absorption of zinc and other minerals, all of the divalent cations, and in fact, all of these minerals studied in the studies that I'll show you in a moment, zinc, copper, magnesium, selenium, these are all divalent cations, can be bound by phytic acid found in legumes and whole grains and their absorption can be prevented. I've shown a study multiple times. I won't show it now, but it's easy to find. It's a study with oysters from, I believe, the 1950s or 1960s, showing that if you give people oysters, you'll see the blood levels of zinc rise and you see hair growth. Well, they didn't study that in the study, but you can imagine that it would help with that. And when you give people that oyster with beans or with a tortilla, that absorption of zinc is significantly lessened. The levels of zinc in the blood are abrogated. In fact, they go to essentially zero if beans and tortillas are given together. It's no sort of cultural uh, affront. It's just these are foods that contain phytic acid, grains, and beans. So where do you get your zinc? You get your zinc from animal foods. You don't get much, if any, bioavailable zinc from plant foods. I remember when I was a raw vegan, and I was a raw vegan, for those of you who didn't know that, about 14 or 15 years ago, I remember hearing in the vegan grapevine that pumpkin seeds were a great source of zinc. Well, pumpkin seeds contain a lot of zinc, but is much of that bioavailable? No, because like most seeds and most plant seeds included in this, including beans and nuts and grains, which are all plant seeds, they're all planted in the ground, they grow into plants, they contain phytic acid, a compound that is a large molecule that chelates these minerals and prevents their absorption into your body. So I also incidentally had a pretty significant magnesium deficiency when I was a raw vegan, but I was eating tons of things like kale and mag and almonds, which are supposed to be great sources of magnesium. Little did I know at the time, live and learn, we all make mistakes, we're humbled, that, that magnesium is not very bioavailable in kale. It's not very bioavailable in things like almonds because of oxalates, which can also chelate these minerals, prevent their absorption, and phytic acid in these plant foods. So my assertion in this podcast will be that if you want to have healthy hair, including animal foods and significant portions in your diet is a way to get that. And that's why I thought the anecdotes from people on carnivore, especially coming from vegan diets, were interesting. We can imagine what's happening when somebody is on a whole foods, plant-based, AKA vegan diet. They're not getting these nutrients and they see hair loss, whether this is telogen effluvium or potentially even alopecia areata, or it's worsening androgenic alopecia. We don't know exactly what the diagnosis is, but there are tons and tons of anecdotes of people losing hair on vegan diets. And we can tell why, because the nutrients found predominantly in bioavailable forms in animal foods help with hair regrowth, hair maintenance, hair health, and you don't get that on a vegan diet. So I don't know what to tell you other than, uh, and this actually came up recently. I was on Russell Brand's podcast this week. I will say this, I applaud vegans for making an intentional choice with regard to their health and their food choices. I just fear that that, that is a wrong food choice and that vegans, people who are plant-based are selecting foods that are deficient in many nutrients. This is something I talked about in the longevity podcast, taurine, anserine, carnitine, choline, carnosine, B12, K2, et cetera. The list goes on. That's just a partial list and deficient in bioavailable forms of many of the minerals and vitamins that are essential for proper hair growth germane to this podcast. So another argument against a vegan diet in my book. So let's look at some of this research. This is a study, a cross-sectional study of plasma trace elements and vitamin content in androgenetic alopecia in men. And I will highlight here that they say, it was shown that all patients with androgenetic alopecia, AGA, have a deficiency of elements, zinc, copper, magnesium, selenium, vitamins B12, E, D, and folic acid is what they say in the paper. One of my pet peeves is that researchers continue to misquote this. This is not a deficiency of folic acid. This is a deficiency of folate. Folic acid does not occur in the human organism. Do not make that mistake if you guys are talking about this. All patients had a deficiency of these vitamins and minerals. Well, zinc found in meat, found in oysters, found in essentially all animal foods. Copper, where do you get copper? This is a key point here, guys. You need to get liver to get copper. There's no copper in muscle meat of any significant amount. There's copper in mushrooms and some mushrooms, questionable bioavailability, but I think the best source of copper is clearly liver. 
Magnesium, I've done content on this. Where do you get magnesium? Well, you can get magnesium easily on an animal-based diet or in animal foods, it's very bioavailable. On an animal-based diet, sources of magnesium would be things like coconut water, orange juice, raw milk. On a strict carnivore diet, you will find that about one pound of meat has around 100 milligrams of magnesium that's very bioavailable. So if you're eating a couple of pounds of meat per day, you're getting 200 plus milligrams of magnesium per day, which is a good amount, especially if it's bioavailable. So animal foods are great sources of magnesium. You've been told it's plant foods, but how much of that is bioavailable? Selenium, I think, again, animal foods are clearly the best bioavailable sources. Some may say, but wait, Paul, what about Brazil nuts? And I think that Brazil nuts are not going to be very bioavailable in their selenium because they're a nut. They're going to contain phytic acid and other things that make it problematic. And there are two different types of selenium, selenocysteine and selenomethionine. Selenomethionine is the form found in Brazil nuts and selenocysteine is the form found in animal foods. And I believe there is a significant amount of evidence to suggest that selenocysteine is superior to selenomethionine. So again, there is this ongoing argument that I would make that animal foods are going to contain more highly bioavailable sources of many of these compounds, essential and important for hair growth and optimal health in general. As we talked about in that article briefly, vitamin B12, well, that's only found in animal foods. Vitamin E, where do you get vitamin E on an animal-based diet? Well, people don't know this, but animal fat is a great source of vitamin E. So butter, raw milk, even tallow, the fat in your steaks, that has vitamin E. And I don't know why the USDA hasn't caught on to this. And I've heard people say this on podcasts. I remember Rhonda Patrick, um, who I've never been able to convince to have an actual respectful debate, um, incidentally, though I respect her work greatly, um, said on Joe Rogan, where do you get vitamin E on a carnivore diet? And you get vitamin E in animal fat. I've, I've done this illustration multiple times. I've checked my levels of vitamin E in my body, in, in the serum and the plasma, and they are above the reference range. They're high normal when I was on a strict carnivore diet. So there's tons of vitamin E. And why wouldn't there be vitamin E in animal foods? It's fat soluble after all. So don't worry about vitamin E on an animal-based diet. You don't need to be eating things like canola oil or seed oils to get vitamin E. That's ludicrous. Vitamin D, you better get out in the sun and then folate. I think you can get folate from foliage. You can get it from plant foods, but I think the best sources of folate for humans are probably going to be things like egg yolks and liver. So again, we're, we're back to a clearly animal-centric diet, an animal-based diet to have the most amount of these good nutrients in your diet. Let's highlight zinc again here. Plasma levels of zinc in males with androgenetic alopecia as possible predictors of the subsequent conservative therapies effectiveness. What the authors of this paper find was that in 48 patients with different stages of this androgenetic alopecia who were treated with 5% topical minoxidil and these trace elements that the zinc deficiency was the most common predictor of failure or success of that therapy. Now, I will talk a little bit about minoxidil later in this podcast, and I'll talk in more detail about Propecia, also known as finasteride, a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, which I'm not a huge fan of, but um, minoxidil is a topically applied therapy for androgenic alopecia, which appears to have significantly less side effects than finasteride or 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. But in this study, they were looking at nutrient levels in conjunction with standard therapies and found that zinc deficiency was a strong predictor of failure of these conservative, that is mainstream therapies. Now, again, where do we get zinc? Animal foods, <laughs> unquestionably, unquestionably animal foods. Another article that I think is great, the role of vitamins and minerals in hair loss, a review. I mean, this is in a dermatology journal. And yet, as I said, most ivory towers won't tell people, men or women looking at this, that nutrient deficiencies can worsen all types of hair loss. The authors say deficiency of such micronutrients may, may represent a modifiable risk factor associated with the development, prevention, and treatment of alopecia, given the role of vitamins and minerals in the hair cycle and the immune defense mechanism. Large double-blind placebo-controlled trials are required to determine the effect of specific nutrient supplementation on hair growth in those with both micronutrient deficiency and non-scarring alopecia to establish any association between hair loss and micronutrient deficiency. They go on to say iron, vitamin D, folate, B12, and selenium are vitamins and minerals that may be involved in hair graying or whitening during childhood or early adulthood. 
supplementing these deficiencies can improve premature graying. So many of you may know someone with premature graying. And again, these nutrients are found in the most bioavailable forms or exclusively in animal foods. I talked earlier about iron, especially in women, but iron deficiency can lead to premature graying. Vitamin D from the sun, folate, vitamin B12, selenium, selenocysteine versus selenomethionine. Again, we'll circle back to that. One of the things that's interesting to note about hair loss research as I dove down this rabbit hole was that there seems to be a very good model for this in vitro. So often when we're looking at research studies, we're thinking in vivo is better in the body. And we see in vitro studies in a test tube and we think this isn't really that accurate. But I found multiple studies in dermatology journals suggesting that in vitro research on the hair follicle is actually pretty good and predictive of what happens in the human body. So when I came across studies like this one, L-carnitine promotes hair growth in vitro, I find it to be interesting and I think that it's probably pretty, pretty valid. So where do you find carnitine? <laughs> in animal foods. The human body makes a little bit of carnitine, but supplementation appears to improve, at least in vitro, could improve hair growth. When was the last time that you or someone you know with male pattern baldness had L-carnitine recommended to them? In fact, when was the last time that someone you know who has male pattern, ba pattern baldness or female pattern baldness had steak recommended to them or liver recommended to them? Well, these are great sources of L-carnitine and all of the nutrients we've talked about so far. So I don't know. I've never heard of anyone doing a steak shampoo. Maybe that's something I should develop a company to do. Like I have actually heard of people putting egg yolks in their hair and I experimented with it. And there are some good nutrients in egg yolks. It made my hair very soft. Many of you may know that I don't really use shampoo or toothpaste for that matter. I don't want to digress too much here, but uh, brushing your teeth with just a toothbrush and water is fine to remove the plaque on there. It's, toothpaste is kind of a scam in my opinion, especially if it has fluoride. I've done podcasts in the past on fluoride, but shampoo often contains many parabens and phthalates and fragrances, all kinds of things that you don't want getting absorbed into your body through your scalp, which is a very vascular region of your body. If you've ever cut your scalp open, you know this. For those who follow me, you may know that I cut my head open on a surfboard fin a few months ago. It's pretty, it's basically healed now, but you don't want those things going into your hair or your scalp. So I just wash my hair with water. Now, many of you may have longer hair than I do or need something to condition your hair. And I've seen lots of people talk about mixtures of egg yolks and egg whites along with apple cider vinegar and potentially honey for the hair. So I tried it. I used egg yolks and whites in the shower and my hair was very soft afterward. It felt great. I don't do it all the time because I surf most days, but maybe once or twice a week, I'll wash with egg yolks now and I'll do some content on that. And the only thing to be aware of if you're washing your hair with egg yolks is that if you like to take a, or whites um, or a raw egg in general, if you like to take a steamy hot shower, you could cook the egg white or yolk in your hair and end up with kind of like semi scrambled eggs in your hair, which may not be super fun. So you might have to take a little bit cooler shower than normal if you want to use eggs. But if you need a interesting shampoo that's basically completely natural and totally safe, try raw eggs potentially with apple cider vinegar or honey. So anyway, that's an aside, but I think that um, uh, I should think about making a steak shampoo. I'm basically joking here, guys, obviously. Another study looks at the effect of a food supplement and a hair lotion on the progression of androgenetic alopecia, noted they did not use a steak lotion. They used a supplement called TRX2, which contained L-carnitine, zinc, niacin, biotin, branched-chain amino acids, and selenium. So again, we're seeing many of the same nutrients, and this was made into a lotion people could put on their hair or a supplement they would take. And in both cases, it did improve the progression of androgenetic alopecia, and in some cases led to hair regrowth. So I mean, making a steak shampoo isn't the worst idea, but it highlights again the idea that carnitine um, in conjunction with other nutrients and cofactors in this study was beneficial for hair regrowth and slowing of the progression of androgenic alopecia. I'll read the results here. The results show that a systemic delivery via nutritional supplement as well as a follicular delivery via topically applied steak lotion. No, I added that. That doesn't say that. It just says a topically applied lotion. Both resulted in reduced hair loss rate as well as an increased antigen to telogen hair ratio. So again, refer back to the discussion at the beginning of the podcast about different phases of hair growth, antigen being the first one, telogen being the final phase of hair growth. So an increased antigen to telogen hair ratio 
essentially means you have more younger hair. This demonstrates the tested formulation is effectively slowing down the progression of androgenetic alopecia. Pretty cool. One more here. Here is a double blind perspective. Well, it's an assessor blinded study. It's a prospective randomized three month controlled study. The efficacy and tolerability of an oral supplement containing amino acids, iron, selenium, marine hydrolyzed collagen, which is actually the cheapest type of collagen, guys. You could just use beef collagen or just make a bone broth. In subjects with hair loss, and they say the hair loss is androgenetic alopecia or telogen effluvium. This is female or male androgenetic alopecia, which is AGA or FAGA. And the results of the study are here. Conclusion, an oral supplement containing a hydrolyzed fish collagen, taurine, cysteine, Methionine, iron, and selenium has demonstrated to improve the clinical efficacy of spe specific anti-hair loss treatments in subjects with AGA, FAGA, or chronic telogen effluvium. So in this one, they were using um, mainstream treatments uh, selected by the physicians, and they were using the supplement as an adjunct. So I would love to see this as a pure supplement without the standard of care, but most people are going to opt for the standard of care and look for this as an a as an enhancing agent. Um, I'll talk a little bit about why I'm not a huge fan of at least five alpha reductase inhibitors for hair loss prevention. But I think this one is interesting. And again, this one starts to dig into taurine. And that's a really cool thing because taurine is one of my favorite nutrients and supplements these days. Again, only occurring in animal foods and shown to benefit longevity, potentially also involved in hair loss stuff. Here's a great study looking at taurine in vitro. So again, they even say here that um, the in vitro modeling of the hair follicle is pretty darn useful clinically. And they say they studied taurine uptake by isolated human hair follicles, its effects on hair growth and survival rate, and its protective potential against transforming growth factor beta, an inhibitor of in vitro hair growth, sort of a inflammatory mediator in the human body, TGF beta one and a master switch of the fibrotic program, which is not what you want. You don't want scarring in your hair follicles. So we showed that taurine was taken up by the connective tissue sheath, proximal outer root sheath and hair bulb, promoted hair survival in vitro and prevented TGF beta one induced deleterious effects on the hair follicle. Go make yourself steak shampoo right now. If you have hair loss, I'm going to make steak shampoo tonight and tell you guys about it. <laughs> I mean, I'm, only half joking, I might actually try putting steak in my hair. But where do you find a lot of taurine? In heart, in liver, in meat. You could make a steak shampoo. Tag me on Twitter or Instagram if you actually do it. But the idea is you can also maybe get the nutrients by eating them, and then they will support your hair follicles in addition. Damn, steak shampoo, good podcast. Specifically looking at FAGA, which is female androgenetic alopecia. There is, like I said, lots of good research to suggest this is clearly related to nutrient deficiencies. And in this article titled Management of Hair Loss in Women, you want the B12 level to be between 300 and 1,000 nanograms per liter. Sometimes people ask me what happens if I have a B12 greater than 1,000 nanograms. It's not an issue in most people because they're eating a lot of meat. Hemoglobin levels greater than 13 grams per deciliter. Serum ferritin concentrations greater than 70 nanograms per milliliter or greater. The two predominant disturbances, diffuse androgen-dependent alopecia and chronic telogen effluvium, both require months of treatment before the benefits can be seen. During this time, several follow-up investigations and reassessing consultations must be done. And so they say that if you can get women to these levels, an optimal hair growth potential is considered to exist when specific parameters for biochemical variables are operating. How do you get women B12? You feed them steak and you swat the salad out of their hands. How do you get women bioavailable iron? You give them steak and liver and all of the good things. So if you or someone you know is a woman who is suffering from FAGA, female androgenetic alopecia, feed them a steak, feed them liver, improve their iron stores, improve their B12 stores, improve their zinc stores, improve their carnitine stores, improve their taurine stores. This is just, I think this stuff is so interesting because I know a lot of people suffer with this. And again, in that article, they were looking at both telogen effluvium and the androgenetic alopecia. So let's do one more with zinc just to really drive this point home. The title of the study is The Therapeutic Effect uh, and the Changed Serum Zinc Level After Zinc Supplementation in Alopecia Areata Patients. So this is the autoimmune hair loss who had low serum zinc level. 
the conclusion is that zinc supplementation needs to be given to alopecia areata patients who have low serum zinc level. We suggest zinc supplementation could be an adjuvant therapy for the alopecia areata patients who have a low serum zinc level for whom the traditional therapeutic methods have been unsuccessful. I would extend the assertion there and say that zinc supplementation in the form of steak and liver in the form of food could be helpful for anyone with hair loss of any type, including androgenic alopecia for both men and women. So do not sleep on zinc. Do not sleep on any of these nutrients that we talked about. And I didn't even mention biotin, but let's just talk about that for a moment. Biotin is often associated with hair, skin, and nail beauty, beautification of hair, skin, and nails. And where do you find biotin? Great source is liver and egg yolks. Again, bioavailable biotin in animal foods. Are we surprised? No. And in fact, if we go deep down the rabbit hole with regard to zinc, you will find lots of evidence that zinc deficiency, chronic vegetarianism or veganism, definitely veganism will be worse, is related to all sorts of skin issues. So zinc critical for skin, hair, and nails as well. Just no question. It's a quote from an article, alopecia developed in patients with acrodermatitis enteropathica shows the characteristics of telogen effluvium, which is a type of non-scarring alopecia and defined by the premature transition of antigen to telogen phase. Patients with telogen effluvium without acrodermatitis enteropathica, also connected with zinc deficiency, exhibit decreased serum levels of zinc compared with healthy individuals. Telogen effluvium can be restored by supplementation with zinc. So get a zinc deficiency. You will have all sorts of problems with your skin. I'm embarrassed to admit this to you guys, but at one time in my life when I was raw vegan, I had chelitis, which is the sort of the cracking at the corners of the mouth. And before I went to medical school and I was a PA in cardiology and I had a phase where I got sucked down the vegan rabbit hole and I was too blind to realize that I had a zinc deficiency from my raw vegan diet and it was causing chelitis in the corners of my mouth. And I actually went to interview at Bastyr University because I thought about going to naturopathic medical school before I applied to allopathic medical school. I ended up going to University of Arizona, getting my MD, but I like the way that naturopathic medical school thinks about causes. They think about, you know, how do we correct the root cause of an illness? I think a lot of naturopathic medicine is too focused on herbs for my liking, but regardless, I like the overarching principles of allopathic medicine. But during my interview at Bastyr University, one of the students there who was in medical school said, you're a vegan and you have this chelitis. Have you thought about your zinc deficiency? And I kind of waved them off. So um, I'll eat some humble um, pie made from steak and liver right now telling you that story. But the point is to illustrate the fact that zinc deficiency is associated with all sorts of skin issues. And if you are a vegan or vegetarian or you know someone who has the cracking at the corners of their mouth, you should definitely think about zinc. Where do you get zinc? Animal foods. So in summary, there's a large amount of medical literature, which I just scratched the surface of, connecting mineral, vitamin deficiencies with worsening hair loss and supplementation with all of these nutrients with reduced progression or restoration of hair growth. I showed a lot of anecdotes of people, which are just anecdotes, but I think that they make us curious and raise eyebrows and definitely merit further investigation. I think furthermore, it's important to note that there are nutrients that we don't traditionally think of as nutrients, things like taurine, carnitine, that are uniquely found in animal foods that have been studied repeatedly and found to be beneficial in hair loss. So why would we not be supplementing with those and people who are vegan or vegetarian who have hair loss? Why would we not just be finally understanding that meat and organs are beneficial for humans and can improve your beauty in all the ways, men and women? Guys, yeah, you can be beautiful too. So that's the first part of the podcast. I wanted to share with you all of those points. Second part of the podcast, I wanna talk about some of my concerns with mainstream hair loss therapy. So finasteride is a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. There are two types of 5-alpha reductase, one and two. It's not terribly important for this conversation. 5-alpha reductase converts testosterone to DHT. And while the physiology at the hair follicles complex, I remain far from convinced that excess androgens, specifically DHT, are the root cause of androgenetic alopecia in connection with genetics. This story doesn't make sense to me. I think there's more going on there and we need to understand this more deeply. Before we go potentially sort of chemically castrating males by giving them 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. And I know there are a lot of smart people who believe these are benign, but when I look at the research regarding post syndrome, it gets scary. The symptoms of post syndrome are basically terrifying. And 
I believe that DHT, dihydrotestosterone, which will be significantly reduced by something like a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, finasteride, are clear. There are so many benefits to having DHT in your body as a male. Why would we want to muck with what nature has been doing? Why do we believe that DHT is the root cause of this? I think there's more to the story and it may actually involve estrogens. It's a complex series of events that maybe I'll have Georgie Dinkov back on to talk about. I've talked to Georgie a lot in the past about many of these things and um, maybe it would be an interesting conversation to see what he thinks about DHT and hair loss and estrogen. Maybe I'll do that in the future, but suffice it to say that at a high level, I don't fully buy the narrative that you need to completely abolish DHT in your body if you have male pattern hair loss. I think that's a horrible idea and I would never recommend taking finasteride. So what are the symptoms of post-finasteride syndrome? Let's just start by saying that post-finasteride syndrome is reported to only occur in a small amount of males, but if even 2% of people get this, it's quite scary. And I think that it's possibly going to be more than that. And this is a condition that occurs after you stop finasteride. I'll show an article titled Post-Finasteride Syndrome. And this paragraph is, like I said, frankly, terrifying to me. Symptoms of PFS, post finasteride syndrome, include decrease or complete loss of libido. Well, we can just stop right there. I don't know if life is worth living without that. Low or no reaction to sexual stimulation, it gets worse, erectile dysfunction, loss of pleasure or absence of sensation and orgasm, loss of genital sensitivity, decrease in ejaculatory volume, poor semen quality and infertility, penis shrinkage, abnormal penis curvature, which is known as Peyronie's disease, testicular pain, testicular reduction, gynecomastia, which is man boobs, chronic fatigue, muscle weakness, muscle atrophy and or pain, muscle spasms, joint pain, dry skin, memory problems, slow thinking, comprehension difficulties, depression, suicidal thoughts, anxiety disorders, panic attacks, emotional detachment, and insomnia. F that is all I got to say, guys. Maybe we'll have to bleep out that F-bomb that I just dropped, but that's scary. And even if that's happening in a small amount of men, can we not just admit that DHT could have very valuable roles in humans like maintaining penis size, sexual stimulation, pleasure, orgasm sensations? Uh, this is a scary thing. And I think that what it argues to me is that we need to fully understand this etiology of hair loss in men before we go essentially just waving our hands and saying, we know why this happens. The case is shut. It's excess DHT. It's more toxic masculinity in men. You have too much DHT, and that's why you're losing your hair. There's something else going on here, I, I am convinced, and I do not believe that DHT is to blame exclusively for this. So that's a scary thing. Now, in fact, I think that that ideology, that paradigm is so damaging that you'll find articles on the web suggesting that you can eat different foods to lower your testosterone, and that might help with your hair loss. Different foods that can lower DHT? That sounds horrible to me. Why would you want to eat these foods? What are some examples of these foods? Well, don't worry, I'll tell you. But it's important to understand that most of the research done with androgens and foods is done in prostate cancer models. And so many of these foods are claimed to improve prostate cancer because they lower androgens, because they're lowering things like testosterone. And while it's not a perfect model of a healthy male to have someone with androgens and prostate cancer, if giving someone a substance lowers androgens in a prostate cancer model, that worries me as a healthy male. What sort of things am I talking about here? Turmeric, yes, curcumin. Throw your curcumin supplement away. I'm telling you, you don't want that. Flaxseed, resveratrol. Why are you taking megadoses of something that's found in small amounts in grapes, which has been shown to decrease androgens in men? Don't do it, my friends. Soy, obviously. Soy specifically decreases androgen receptor density. And I'll show you articles to corroborate all of those things because I would never intentionally lead you guys astray. Pilot study of dietary fat restriction and flaxseed supplementation in men with prostate cancer before surgery, et cetera, et cetera. That's the title of the study. Basically, you can read the results, but it lowered androgens, guys. You don't want flaxseeds in your diet, guys. You can get your omega-3s from meat and organs and eggs. Malignans are going to cause problems in terms of your androgens. And this next one is one of my favorite ones because it really triggers um, people when they get super excited about soy protein. Isoflavone-rich soy protein isolates suppress androgen receptor expression. 
without altering estrogen receptor beta expression or serum hormonal profiles in men at high risk of prostate cancer. You don't want to decrease the amount of androgen receptors in your body. <laughs> Something that's not been talked about much is androgen receptor density. But one of the things we know is that meat, saturated fat can improve androgen receptor density. You want your androgen receptors to be dense. You don't want them to be decreased. So people in the informational sphere and health sometimes say, where is the evidence that soy is harmful? Well, there's clearly a study showing that decreases androgen receptor density. Why would you want to do that? I don't know. Modulation of AKR1C2 by curcumin decreases testosterone production in prostate cancer. Yeah, it probably also decreases testosterone production in healthy males. Why are you taking turmeric in the first place, which is where you get curcumin? You're taking it because you have inflammation, but what is causing the inflammation in the first place? I'm not a fan of turmeric. I talked about it in my book, and I've talked about it on multiple podcasts in the past. Here's the Cliff Notes version. There are some studies suggesting that turmeric may benefit people with osteoarthritis pain. I believe osteoarthritis is in some ways autoimmune, possibly connected with oxalate deposition in those joints, almost certainly connected with more than simply wearing your joints down, which is the mainstream ideology. But if you have inflammation that you're trying to get rid of with turmeric, you're doing it wrong. Yes, I said it, you're doing it wrong. If you want to get rid of your inflammation, correct the root cause. Don't use turmeric, which has all kinds of potentially negative side effects, including lowering androgens in prostate cancer models and potentially in healthy men also. Don't use turmeric to lower inflammation. That inflammation is there. It's giving you an indication that something is off in your body. That's what you should be doing. Turmeric is bullshit in my opinion for many reasons, but Again, this is the way that I think about things differently than most people. And as I mentioned, resveratrol in megadoses is shown to decrease androgens in prostate cancer models. So put your resveratrol down, put your flaxseed down, put your curcumin down, throw the turmeric out the window into the forest or the jungle, let some other animals or fungi just decompose that stuff. It's not good for you. And I know some of you are having crises right now, but just Look at the research on turmeric. I can do a whole podcast on it if you guys want. I've talked about it many times in the past and done lots of content on social media about it as well. And for God's sake, put down your freaking soy protein. Get some raw milk, get some whey protein, get some hydrolyzed beef protein. That's gonna be way better for you than soy protein. And many of you may know that I've been skeptical of protein powders in the past, but I think that there is a place for them at some point for humans. Look, if you're on the go, a protein powder can be good. Get a good quality protein powder. In fact, I recently learned that it's very hard to get raw whey protein. And if you know anything about my interest in raw milk and raw dairy, whey protein appears to be helpful for humans from an allergenic perspective, decreasing rates of asthma, eczema, and allergies when people are drinking raw milk versus pasteurized milk. So the idea of helping humans get a raw whey protein would be great. Maybe we can figure it out. I think that if you have the opportunity you should drink raw milk or you should eat a steak. But if you're on the go, a good quality protein supplement is great. My problem with most protein supplements is also that they contain things like stevia, which I'm not a fan of, sucralose, which is Splenda, all kinds of other garbage in there. So who knows? Maybe I'll change my mind and have to make a high quality protein supplement in the future. But I'll tell you guys that if that happens, it won't have any flavoring because I will never put an artificial sweetener in a protein powder. But I do know, talking to people, that there are times that people are on the go and a protein powder can be helpful. But for God's sake, don't use proteins that are from soy. And why would you use pea protein or hemp protein? Just use a whey or hydrolyzed beef protein, guys. It'll be way better. And flax seeds, resveratrol, all the other stuff, you get it. Leave it out. So hopefully we've got some hairs regrowing after listening to this podcast. Hopefully we've got some steak shampoo happening. Maybe we've got some soy protein going in the trash along with resveratrol supplements and turmeric being thrown out the window of your car as you're driving down the highway and listening to this podcast. All of those things make me very, very happy. Hopefully this is helpful to you guys. If you're listening on YouTube, please let me know what you think of this podcast in the comments and put ideas for future podcasts, whatever you guys wanna hear about. People you would like to hear me interview, put in the comments on YouTube and I'll try and get them on the podcast. So hopefully this one is helpful to you guys and I will see you guys soon.